notice and invitation. that was my thoughts indeed at the thought of one degree of got precious air conditioning going out that door was almost too much to bear but it sure is good to see everybody we're glad you're here tonight if you'd like to be turning your bibles to genesis chapter 37 genesis chapter 37 and we're going to be reading the story of joseph genesis chapter 37 Good to see everybody. So uh, thankful for Jenna this morning. That was a real uh, uh, encouragement. So thankful for her decision to put on Christ and baptism. And that's just uh, uh, just 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 makes your heart uh, feel good. Uh, thanks. Uh, you know, you think about the family and the blessings that they receive as a result of that. And I told her when she obeyed the gospel, that's a decision that she will never ever regret. I encourage all young people to you know think along those same lines. Um, Fear God and keep his commandments. You know, the Bible talks about remember thy creator in the days of thy youth, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And I realize that the, uh, you know, the Hebrews thought a lot differently about youth than do we, but uh, the admonition is still there. The younger you can start obeying the gospel, the younger you can start serving God, uh, the, the right attitude, the right motivation keep you out of a lot of other things. And uh, just real thankful for her. Let's look at Genesis 37. We're going to read about another young man. A young man, very extraordinary young man. And notice in Genesis 37 at verse 1, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph was 17 years old and was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, speculation abounds about what did he say. Uh, if you know the character of Joseph, then I would imagine, and you know the character of his brothers, that they were probably up to some things that they probably shouldn't have been. It says it was a bad report. Now, evil in the Old Testament doesn't always mean sin. Sometimes it just means bad. Apparently, they were doing something that they shouldn't have been. And, G and notice Joseph is not called a snitch. He is not called somebody who works with the authorities. He's not a gossip. Joseph was a good young man, and apparently he saw something that shouldn't have been going on, and so he tells his father about it. Well, of course, that is not going to raise him up in the eyes of his brothers who dislike him already. Notice, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Now, that's a sad statement, but it is the case. Notice, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Now, uh, the idea there, there's a couple of things. First of all, if you remember, Rachel uh, didn't have children for a long time. That started the whole Bilhah Zilpah thing. Leah was having kids left and right, it seemed. And uh, Rachel couldn't get in on the action, you know, if you will. She couldn't have children. The Lord had said it closed her womb. So she wanted something. So she gave her handmaid, uh, Bilhah, to her husband, of course, who had two children. And then, you know, Leah, not to be outdone, she gives her handmaid. Zilpah, what you have is a family in a mess. First of all, you had a mess when he married the second wife, and then it really got bad when he has four wives. So he has four wives. Those, men, those women, even though sometimes they're referred to as concubines, they were still legally wives. They just wouldn't have had the same rights when it came to uh, inheritance, things of that nature. So, uh, but he loves this particular child more than others, Joseph. And that's not Joseph's fault. There's nothing that Joseph can do to stop that. His daddy loves him. And of course, I'm sure he was happy with the fact that his daddy loved him. Any child would be. I listened to Hugo McCord not too long ago, just a couple of minutes ago, actually, an hour or two ago, on Voices of the Past on GBN. And he said something that I, I thought, boy, that's fitting with the lesson tonight. He said he went to board with the family up north. And the woman came in, and she said, uh, welcome to our home. You know, she had a little baby that she was cuddling, cuddling. And let's just give them names. I forget the names exactly. But she said, this is Jeremiah, and I love him more than all the other kids combined. And he thought with himself, well, that, that don't, that's not right. And then in walks a daughter, and she says, and there's uh, Rachel, we'll say. And I love her more than all the kids combined. And he was like, well, I'm going to have to preach to her. I don't. 
And then she went in and walked another child, and she said, and there's Paul. Uh, he's our third son, and I love him more than all of them combined. And then he understood. She loved all of them. And, and when that particular one was being addressed, why, wow, that was the apple of her eye. She loved him more than the rest, but not any, you know, collectively. She didn't love them any less. And uh, he was talking about Psalms 23 and how God loves us. He loves us individually. And just because there's a whole group doesn't mean he loves me any less or loves you any less. Unfortunately, that is not what is taking place here. Jacob is making a mistake in that he has given the brothers even more ammunition to dislike Joseph. And he shows that almost a badge, if you will, by giving him this special robe. And uh, I don't know if this is one of my favorite stories when I was growing up, going to Sunday school class, and those old flannel boards, this was one of my favorites. Because you remember, they'd always bust out with that coat of many colors, that beautifully uh, ornate thing, and his would always stick out compared to everybody's earth colors, you know, earth tones. And so his stuck out. Well, notice that didn't make him very happy with his brethren. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more, this wasn't something that Jacob even tried to hide. They hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And of course, Joseph telling his brothers his dream and his father's dream didn't help out a whole lot. Even though it was the truth and he was dreaming this and this is what God said would happen, it still didn't raise him up in the eyes of his brethren and they loathed him even more. Now you remember later on as Joseph is coming out to them again, you know that's gotta be going on in their mind. They're thinking, well, here he comes again and uh, <clears throat> they're feeding their flocks in Shechem, verse 12. Uh, Israel tells Joseph, you know, go and, you know, to your brethren there. And so he goes. And he finds out that they're in Dothan. Every time I go through Dothan, you think about the story of Joseph. And when they come there, his brothers want to kill him. Verse 19. And they said one to another, Behold, the dreamer cometh. Now he's told them the dreams, of course, where they're all going to bow down to him. They say, come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say, some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what shall become of his dreams. So right there gives you a big uh, idea of the character of these brothers. There's a couple of brothers here that stand out, one of them of which is Reuben. Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, let's don't shed innocent blood. Let's put him in a pit over here and notice he wanted to get his hands on him and to deliver him again to his father, it says there at the verse 22. It says, And it came to pass when Joseph came to his brethren that they stripped Joseph of his coat, his coat of many colors, and they took him and they throwed him into a pit. Now here's Judah. Now Judah is going to be the one that's actually going to go full circle. He is actually going to stand instead. So let me stand here for Benjamin when all this comes to a head with the story of Joseph. He's the one that says, let me pay the price. Let me stay behind. But what's his idea here? Well, hey, we can't get no money out of this. Well, let's don't slay him. Let's sell him. And of course, that's exactly what they do to the Midianite uh, merchants. Well, chapter 38 is kind of interesting because we have the story of uh, Judah thrown in there uh, about uh, you know the story of Tamar. And I guess that's put in there for, because Tamar is in, the, of course, the genealogy of Christ. And then we see the progression of Joseph's story as he goes into the house of Potiphar, and that doesn't work out well, even though he's great. And I think sometimes the reason Potiphar was mad was the fact he was going to lose the best employee that he had. But he sends him to prison, and of course the pr in the prison he uh, meets the baker and the cupbearer for the king and uh, the, you know, gives them their dreams. And then, of course, Pharaoh has his dreams, and the next thing we see is Joseph being, being elevated uh, to the second in command, if you will. So tonight's lesson is Joseph is a type of Christ. And what is a type? Well, I wanted to share this with you because it's one of those places where when we think of types, it's a word that theologians use. It's not a biblical word. It's kind of like the word Jehovah. Do you realize that the word Jehovah is not a biblical word? As a matter of fact, it didn't even exist till 1518, and it's when they took the, uh, the you know letters of, Y-H-W-H in the German and put the J in front, of course, and created this word, and it's real amazing because, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they, you know, that's one of the things they stand by, but they don't realize they're, they, they say, we want to be called what God's people were called and, and worship the God and call God his covenant name, and they use, of course, Jehovah 
when that word did not exist prior to 1518. Well, <clears throat> a type is a figure or ensemble, uh, which we would say example, of something future and more or less prophetic. It's called the antitype. In other words, we have a type, and then the antitype in the New Testament. That's from Bollinger's uh, book. Tupas is the Greek word. Now, tupas is the idea to strike a blow, and all of us probably remember the movie. You remember the show Dragnet, one of my favorite shows growing up? Remember that old sweaty hand? That guy would take that mallet up there, and he'd hit that with that hammer, and it would leave that uh, Roman numeral seven. And so that is, that is the definition of tupas. That's the definition of a type. It is a, and it's translated in the King James, a print or a mark. It's translated a figure. Translated form, fashion, manner, pattern, ensemble, example, and, but that's not touching, hiding, or hair, what we talk about types. What do I mean by that? Theologians have used the word to describe something totally different that would be far more in line with the Greek word skia, not tupas. And so see, here's people using a word that doesn't mean what it does in the Bible, for something else, and that's just something, you know, you have to, like the word hermeneutics, where in the world we come up with that? Well, that's the Greek word for Bible interpretation. So uh, we see for the law having a shadow, there's that word skia, uh, the Greek word skia, and it means it was a type. That's how we would say it today. So that's where that word type comes from, Colossians 2.17, which are a shadow. There's that word again, a type of that which is to come in the body. These things that happened in the Old Testament were shadows of what was happening, going to happen in the New Testament, and we can look back at that now and see that. And so the definition would really be a likeness, likenesses that are distinctive. In other words, this really sticks out. You have to be careful with types and antitypes because sometimes you can push it too hard and make a, a type be something that it's really not. So we have to be careful and just basically let the Bible do that. We think of some types or some uh, patterns or Skia, you know, shadows in the Old Covenant, we think of the Lamb, the Passover Lamb. Immediately we think of Jesus the Christ, who is our Passover. Did I lose everything? I noticed the screens are doing something. Is it, do y'all see a picture of Jesus on there? With a, okay, good deal, because I, I noticed they kind of went away for a moment. Another type that we find in the New Testament is the type of Jonah. And Jonah, of course, says, uh, notice what Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 40. It says, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Now, Jonas there is the uh, Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Jonah. Don't let that throw you. <clears throat> it says, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the earth. And so we see that what happened to Jonah was a type, a shadow, something pointing towards. And Jesus uses that and says, just like Jonah was in the whale's belly for three days, I, or the uh, fishes, uh, he says whale's good. Uh, he says, I'm going to be in the earth. Another type that we find, you remember the story in Moses in the book of Numbers and the brazen serpent. And notice, immediately we think of that brazen serpent, we think of the cross of Christ. And why do we do that? Because Jesus says in John 13, 14, two verses in front of the, you know, the one we all can probably quote in verse 16, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And, of course, some people say, you know, some, one of the translations, talk, uh, accounts, talks about, you know, here he's signifying what death, that he would die. Probably my favorite type or shadow in the Old Covenant or the New Covenant has to be the tabernacle. There are just too many ungetoverables for you to miss it. There's this fence that surrounds the tabernacle, the place where you would come and you would deliver your animal. You would deliver your animal. A priest would take that animal and slay that animal. And then he would wash himself in water, a laver, before he could enter into the Holy of Holies, where you find the seven pieces of furniture. We think of the seven, or the, uh, excuse me, six uh, pieces of furniture. You have the altar at the bottom there, the laver, which you could go into the holy place, which contained three pieces of furniture, the menorah, which is the, uh, the light, the altar of incense in the middle there, and then the table of showbread. And, you know, probably that's the easiest one to see today is the table of showbread. The holy place represents the church. And then, last but not least, behind the veil was the holy of holies. And, of course, in there was kept the Ark of, Ark of the Covenant, which originally held Moses' rod that blossomed, a bowl of manna, and the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God. But you'll remember, uh, written by uh, God. But uh, you'll remember that by the time it gets to the temple, 
in Solomon's day, the only thing left in it is the Ten Commandments. So another type, the high priest, he would go in, do you remember? He would sprinkle real animal blood on the seat that covered up the ark. But the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that Jesus for one time has gone into the holiest of holies, not made with hands, that is to say, you know, not of this earth. He went into the one that this was a shadow of, and he offered up his blood one time for all time. And so we, that is, that is what we're talking about when it comes to types. Now, Jesus, of course, is our royal brother, and we're going to see that Joseph is a type of the Christ. What do we mean by that? First of all, both men were despised. Remember, we just read that Joseph was despised by his brothers. But in John chapter 1 at verse 11 it says he came unto his own and what happened? The Jews rejected the Christ. They did not receive him. And so they were both despised. Not only that, but they were both sold. And Genesis chapter 37 at verse 28, the Midianites came by and notice what they give for him. 20 pieces of silver in chapter 37 verse 28. And of course they take him to Joseph. Now in Matthew, in to Israel, excuse me. Yeah, I've got that wrong. Took him to Egypt. See what happens when you start reading before you talk. Matthew 26, 15 says, uh, of course, this is, this, this is Judas Iscariot who's going in to make a, a deal. He says, what will you give me that I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted for him. Uh, then some of the other translations say they counted out. In other words, they're making a price. They counted out for him for 30 pieces of silver. Joseph for 20. Jesus for 30, and I guess we can see inflation there because both cases, that's the, pay, that's the, the, uh, the case or the price for a slave. 20 for Joseph, later on we see 30 for Jesus. And think about how many folks today, we think about Joseph's brothers selling him, that's terrible. We think about Judas betraying the Christ and then go later on and even kiss him. But brethren, think about us. Think about sometimes when we betray the Christ by doing that which we know is wrong. We shouldn't do that, but many times we'll find us doing things that, that are, are, are contrary to the law of God, we're contrary to what Jesus would have us to do, and in a sense, that is a selling out. We have to be careful that today we don't sell out the Christ. Notice that both had great love. In Genesis chapter 42, verse 24, it says he turned himself about. Now, he, he's going to take one of their brothers and arrest him, but it's killing him. You remember... He recognizes them. They don't recognize him. Apparently, the Egyptians dressed a whole lot different than did the Hebrews. Um, and so he recognizes them. They wore makeup and stuff, too. I think the movies really do a good job portraying that because Egyptians would often, you know, shave their heads and so forth, but the Hebrews wouldn't cut their hair. And so I think they do a good job with that. And so they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. This is Joseph. He's now second in charge of all. And so he wants to find out about his daddy and things, but he plays it in such a way as to give them an opportunity to make things right. But notice he goes and he weeps. He loves his brethren, but there's some lessons that they need to learn. There's some things that they need to get past. And so he loves his brethren, but think about Jesus. Jesus loves us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I love the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Brethren, that was me. That was you. Christ died for us when we weren't pretty. It says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare die. Verse 8, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Thanks be unto God for that unspeakable gift. Not only did both have great life, but both went through what they went through to preserve life. Notice uh, 45, Genesis 45 at verse 5. We also read in chapter 50 this morning in our, if you remember, in our Sunday school lesson. Because after, even though Joseph done, is going to treat his brother and wife good, they come back to him. His daddy is still alive. And remember, his daddy dies, and his brethren are thinking, uh-oh, all bets are off. He is going, now he's really going to get after us. Now we're in trouble. And, of course, that's when they said, uh, before Dad died, he said, you know, don't hurt us. <laughs> Basically, they make up the story. And that's when Joseph said, no, you meant to me to do evil. 
but God meant this to save life. Notice in chapter 45, the first time he talks to him about it. He says, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Joseph says, The things that have taken place with me are so that our family can live, and, and the nations, really. Matthew, notice this account. Notice Matthew, it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Both were sent to preserve life. Remember when Je Peter makes that great confession in John chapter 6. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? And Peter says, Where would we go? Where shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So both were sent, and their jobs were to preserve life. And notice both were found alive in, in uh, uh, Genesis 45, verse 3. Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Boy, can you know, when you read that story, can you not just, you can almost hear in your own mind's eye the jaws hitting the floor. You're who? You know, oh, no. Uh, unless you're Benjamin, things are bad. But it's not. Notice Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. And he says, Does, is daddy alive? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. They're thinking, we're as good as dead. This man has the power to just speak, and our lives will be taken from us. That's what they're thinking. That's not Joseph's plan at all. Of course, he wants to spare them. Notice Jesus in Luke 24, verse 5. And they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth. And they said unto them, and the, the, the man at the tomb said unto them, Why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Jesus was alive. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee. Jesus isn't dead. In Mark 16, 6, remember Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of John, James, and Salome, the mother of James and John. They all go. They're going to, you know, wrap the body and so forth. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. We have a beautiful song in our songbook. Uh, he is not here. He's risen. Uh, both were found alive. Joseph wasn't dead as everybody had thought. Uh, and I know his brothers never thought they'd see him again. And notice the compassion they had. In chapter 45, verse 7, it says, And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And not only their lives, but, I mean, you think about the, the, the world, really, uh, the known world that could trade with Egypt and, and could get food as a result of the great famine that was on the whole earth. Notice what Paul says about Jesus. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for his sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. Notice the six things we've looked at so forth. The types and the antitypes. The shadow. Joseph was a type of or a shadow of the Christ. Despised. Sold. Had great love for his brethren, even though he was despised. To preserve life. Found life. And compassion. And last but not least, both offered pardon. It was within Joseph's right to have his brethren executed. He could have just said the word and nobody would have even thought anything about it. They would have simply done what the second in command of all of Egypt said to do. But he didn't. And Genesis 45 verse 15 says, Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and whipped, wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. He received them back. Even though those sorry rascals had sold him off into slavery, they would have killed him if the opportunity had been right. They were wicked in their hearts. They couldn't stand him. They did everything they could to get rid of him. And lo and behold, he says, I love you. I love you and I love Daddy. And I want you to come here and I want you to live with me. I forgive you. And they think that he's only doing that because of his Daddy because we see in Genesis chapter 50, they're like, oh, man, we're in trouble now. And, of course, Joseph said, no, you've got it wrong. I'm not going to hurt you. I am your brother. I love you. Well, notice what Peter says unto those who crucified. He, he tells them, by wicked hands, your wicked hands, you have crucified and slain the Son of God. And they're like, man and brethren, what shall we do? And there was an escape. There was a pardon. Jesus loved you so much that he gave himself for you. That if you'll repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You receive the Holy Spirit, and the Lord will add you to the church. Acts 2 and verse 47, and immediate fellowship. 
started worshiping together. They uh, enjoyed that pardon that God had promised. Think of the type, brethren. It's not, it's, these are not just happenings. It's not just something that's, uh, you know, well, it just happened that way. Both these men despised. Both were sold. Both had great love for the very folks who were turning them over, who were selling them out. Both gave their, their all to preserve life. Both were found alive. Both had compassion. And both offered pardon. Joseph offered pardon to his brethren. Christ offers pardon to us. Just as, you know, that takes place, there are conditions. There are conditions. And you'll, you'll see what Joseph put his brothers through. He needed to see that they weren't going to do to his brother what they did to him. And Judah stood up and said, If you keep Benjamin here, it will kill my daddy. Let me pay the price. Let me stay here in his stead. Let me pay the penalty. And you send Benjamin back to Jacob so my father can live. Jesus did the same thing. Jesus left heaven, took on the form of a man to say, let me take place of Ron Gilbert. Don't kill him. Let me take his place. And you put your name there. Jesus took your place and died upon that cross. And don't you say for everybody. You say for you. This is a personal thing. And just like that woman could look at any one of her children and say, you know what, that's my favorite child. And mean it with all of her might. The very thing God says to us today, you're his favorite child. Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you done what is necessary to become a child of his? Don't put it off. You see, man's disease is sin. And Jesus Christ is the remedy and gave himself for it. If you're here tonight and not a New Testament Christian, let me encourage you to take Judah. You know, what Judah did for Benjamin, don't you know Ju Benjamin appreciated that? Brethren, we need to appreciate what Jesus Christ has done for us. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, you need to. Maybe you have in times past, you've left your first love. Remember the sacrifice that was given. If we can help you in any way, we encourage you to come. As together we stand and sing. All things are ready. Come to the peace.